transaction. Stop transaction. Okay. 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 Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the uh, for the project workshop. Um, the title for uh, the first topic, which is machine learning and deep learning. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to try like cover lots of topics. Uh, first of all, what is machine learning, uh, applications and features, uh, machine learning life cycles. Uh, also, I will talk about the different uh, types of machine learning algorithm, like supervised learning. We have different types, like linear regression, holistic, decision tree, uh, random forest, uh, naive based classifier. Uh, also, we have unsupervised learning, uh, for example, like key mean uh, clustering. Also, I will talk about the third type, which is reinforcement uh, learning. So I will talk about analogy and different uh, definition of um, reinforcement learning. Also, I will talk about Markov decision uh, process. Um, also, if, if we have time, uh, I will cover um, some topics about deep learning. So what's the difference between deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence? Um, what are the different applications? Uh, what, what I mean by uh, perceptron, okay, or neuron? Um, what's the role of weight and, and, uh, and bias for artificial neural network? Um, something like this, okay? So without much ado, let's get started. So what is machine learning? Um, so machine learning is an application um, of artificial intelligence that provides system as the ability to learn and improve from experience without being programmed. Okay, uh, machine learning helps um, like getting computers to program themselves and also teaching them to make decisions using data. Okay, um, now machine learning is a is a class of algorithm which is data driven. Um, that's unlike normal algorithm. It is the data that does what the good answer is. Okay. Um, so if we have a look um, at the different features of machine learning, so first of all, it uses the data to detect pattern in a data set, okay, and adjust the program action. Okay. It focuses on the development of computer programs that it can teach it themselves. Uh, to grow and change when exposed to new data. Okay, so it is not just like the old data in which it has been trained. So whatever a new data is entered, the program will change according to that. So it enables computers to find hidden insights using a iterative algorithm without being uh, programmed. Um, so now let's understand what exactly it works. Okay, so um, if we have a look at the diagram which is given here, we have traditional programming on one side, we have machine learning on the other side. So first of all, in traditional program, what we use to do, uh, we provide the data, provide the program, and the computer used to generate um, the output. Okay, so things have changed now. So in machine learning, what we do is uh, provide the data and we provide a predicted output to the machine. Now what machine does is uh, it learns uh, from the data, find hidden insights and creates a model. Okay, now it takes the output data again and it trains the system. So uh, the model gets better every time. Okay, so there's a difference between traditional programming and machine learning. Um, so, um, machine learning has lots of lots of application. So the first application of machine learning in the industry, I would like to get your attention, is the navigation or the Google Maps. So um, Google Maps is the application we use whenever we go out, right, and require assistance in direction and the traffic. Um, now, how does it know that? Well, it is a combination um, of people using uh, the surface, okay, uh, the historical data collected over time, and a few tricks uh, occurred from the other companies, everyone like using maps, um, is providing their location, uh, their average speed, uh, the route in which they are traveling, 
which in turn helps Google collect massive data about the traffic. Um, now coming to the next or the second application, which is the social media. Um, if we talk about Facebook, so one of the most common application is like automatic uh, friend uh, suggestion. Um, in Facebook, um, I'm sure you might have gotten this. So it's present in all the other social media platforms as well, and Instagram, whatever the application. So Facebook use face detection and image recognition to find the face of the person, which match its database. And for that reason, it uh, suggests to us to take that person based on their faces, right? Um, also, uh, for transportation, now transportation is another industry where machine learning is used. So if you have used uh, an application to book a cab recently, then you are already uh, using machine learning. What happened is that it provides an application which is unique, unique to you, uh, to dictate your location and provide option to either go home or office, right? Um, now coming to the virtual, like virtual person assistant. Um, um, so as the name say, suggests, virtual person assistant assist in finding useful information when asked uh, by a voice or a text. Here uh, you have the major application of machine learning, which is speech uh, recognition, speech to text conversation. Uh, it's, it's like natural uh, language processing. Um, all you need to do is ask very simple question, like for example, what is my schedule for tomorrow? Or show my upcom upcoming flights. Now for answering your personal assistant, um, search for information to collect the information. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, recently, uh, personal assistants are being used in different um, food ordering application uh, for online training and for websites. Um, also for um, like product recommendation. Uh, now it's one of the area where machine learning is necessary. Uh, now suppose you check an item in Amazon. Okay but you don't buy it, then in the next day, you are watching a video on YouTube and suddenly you see the same ad for the same item, okay? And then you switch to a Facebook and there also you see the same ad again. And again, you, you go back to like for any other website and you see the same ad for the same items. So how, have, how does this happen? This happens because uh, Google tracks your uh, like your search history and recommend based on your research history. Okay, this is one of the coolest application of machine learning. And in fact, 35% of Amazon revenue is generated by the product recommendations, uh, which is very like very fun. Um, another application is self-driving cars. Okay. Um, if we talk about self-driving cars, it's here and people are already using this. Um, now machine learning plays a very important role in self-driving cars. So in Tesla, which is the leader in the business now, um, uh, use also machine learning for like their design of the, their cars. So now in the media, it said that they didn't train their model to detect people or any of the objects as such as the model works on deep learning. Uh, it uses a lot of sensors, which is are a part of um, IoT or Internet of Things. Okay. Um, also, we have Google Translate. Everyone uses Google Translate for sure. So now remember uh, the time like when you travel to a new place and you find it's very difficult to communicate with the locals or finding uh, local spots where everything is written in a different language. Okay. So when those days are gone, now Google Machine Translation is a neural uh, machine and learning that's work on thousands of language and dictionary. Uh, it uses like uh, neural language processing to provide the most accurate translation of any of any sentences of words. Um, also, another application is we are talking about dynamic pricing setting. Okay, uh, for example, Uber. <clears throat> How does Uber determine the price if you are getting late for a meeting and you need 
like to book an Uber in a crowded area. OK, so get ready to pay twice the normal fare, right? So it depends on different factors. Uh, now coming to the final application of machine learning we have is the online video streaming. So everyone is using online video streaming for sure, like Netflix or Amazon Prime video. OK, guys, so we have lots of lots of application of machine learning. Um, OK, now. Um, um, a typical machine learning life cycles, any machine learning, any machine learning you are talking about, we have like six steps. OK, uh, the first step is collecting data. Second is data wrangling or we call it data cleaning. OK, then we have the third step is analyze the data. Fourth steps where we train the algorithm. The first step is where we test the algorithm. And sixth step is when we deploy this particular algorithm for um, industrial applications. OK. So when we talk about the first step, uh, which is collecting data. So here um, data is being collected from different sources, right? And this stage involves the collection of all relevant data from different sources. OK. Now, if we talk about data wrangling, OK. Um, so uh, data wrangling is a process um, like of cleaning and converting raw data into formats that allow um, convenient consumption. Now, this is very important part in the machine learning life cycle, and it's very times that we are uh, received the data, which is clean and is in probable formats. Um, sometimes this value is missing. Sometimes there are wrong um, wrong values. Sometimes data format is different. So uh, a major part in machine learning life cycles go to data wrangling and data cleaning. OK. So um, if we talk about the next step, which is data analysis. OK, so data is analyzed to select and filter the data required to prepare the model. OK, so in this step, we take the data. OK, use machine learning algorithm to create a particular model. OK, we will understand this in, in more details uh, after that. OK, um, now when we um, like have a model, what we do is uh, train the model, train the model. Now here we um, use the data sets and the algorithm is trained the data set. Um, coming. After this is testing. So the, that the testing data set determine the accuracy of our model. So what we do is provide the test data set to the model, which tells us the accuracy of this particular model. OK, for example, we have 60%, 70%, 80%. It depends on the requirement of the company or the application. OK, so actually what we did um, what we always doing if you have like 100 data sets, we take, for example, 70 percent of the data for training and 30 percent of the data for testing to validate the model to make sure the model is working well or not. And how we know that the model is working well or not from the accuracy. So if we have accuracy 90 percent, it means this model is working very well. If the accuracy, for example, 20 percent, it means the model is not working very well. So we need more data to do more training for uh, the model. OK, finally, we have uh, the operation and the optimization. So if the speed and the accuracy of the model is acceptable, then the model should be deployed in real system. OK, um, the model that is used in the production should be made with all the available data. Um, Improve models will improve with the amount of variable data used to create them. So if you have 100 data, it's better than you have just 10 data. So as much data as you have, the model will be more accurate. OK. Any questions so far, guys? OK, we are good. OK. Um. So for machine learning, we have actually um, three types. OK, we have unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and we have supervised learning. OK. Um, 
So if we talk about supervised machine learning, so supervised learning is where you have the input variable X and the output variable Y and use an algorithm to learn the mapping function from the input to the output. Okay. So if we take this case uh, or the case of uh, object detection here or phase detection here. Uh, so first of all, what we do is um, input the raw data in the form of labeled faces. OK, and again, it's not necessary that we just input faces to train the model. OK, what you do is input uh, like a, a mixture of faces and non faces images. So as you can see here, we have labeled faces. What we do is provide the data to the algorithm. The algorithm uh, will create a model. It uses the training, uh, the training uh, data sets to understand what exactly is in a face, what exactly is in the picture, um, what is not a face. And after that, um, the model is done with the training and the processing. So to test the model, what we do is provide a particular input of a face or a noun face. Um, the major part of supervised learning here is um, that we exactly know the output. So when we um, are providing a face, we um, ourselves know that it is a face. So to test this particular model and to get the accuracy, we use the labels to input through that. Okay, this is for supervised learning. Okay. Um, Next, when we talk about unsupervised learning, so unsupervised learning is a training of a model using the information that is not classified or not labeled. Okay, now this model can be used to cluster the input data in classes, for example, for um, a basket full of vegetables. Okay, we can cluster different fruits based on their color or their size. OK, so if I have a look at this particular example here, what we are doing is we are input, inputting the raw data, which can be either apple, banana, mango. OK, what we're going to have here, which was uh, discussed in the supervisor learning are the labels. OK, so what what the algorithm does is it visually gets the feature of a particular set of data. It makes clusters. So what will happen is it will make a cluster of red looking fruits, right? Which uh, which is here apple, right? Uh, yellow looking fruit, which here is banana, right? And based on the shape also it determine what exactly the fruit is and categorize a mango, banana or apple. OK, guys, this is unsupervised learning. Um, now the third type of learning which we have here is reinforcement learning. So um, reinforcement learning is a learning by interacting with um, a space or the environment. It selects an action um, on the basis of its past experience and also by new choices. OK, so uh, reinforcement learning learn from the consequences of its actions rather than from being taught. So if we have a look at this example here, the input data we have, uh, what it does is it goes uh, to the training, go to the agent where the agent selects the algorithm. It takes the best action from the environment, gets the reward. So if you provide a picture of a green apple, although the apple is red, what will it do is it will try to get an answer and with the past experience, what it has, it will uh, recreate the algorithm and then finally provide an output, which is according to our requirement. OK, I will discuss in more details about the three types. This is just like general uh, description about the different types of uh, machine learning. Um, so what I will do now, I will dig deeper into all these types of machine learning one by one. OK. So let's, uh, let's uh, get started with supervised learning, OK? Um, and understand exactly what is supervised learning and what is the different algorithm inside um, this type of, um, of machine learning. OK, um, so supervised learning is where you have the input variable X 
and the output variable y and using the algorithm to learn the mapping function from the input to the output. Okay, as I mentioned earlier uh, with the example of phase, uh, of phase detection. So if we have like um, a look at the supervisor learning steps, what, um, what will be the workflow here? So the model is used, as you can see here, we have um, like the historical data. Okay, then again, we have the random sampling. Um, we split the data and test the data using the training data sets with the help of machine learning, which is supervised with machine learning in this case. Then we create the statistical model. Okay, um, now after we have a model, which is being generated with the help of uh, the training data set. What we do is use the testing data, okay, for prediction and testing. Um, what we do is get the output, and finally we have the model. So whatever the data you have, you have 100, you have 1,000, you just divide this data to, for example, 70% for training and 30% for testing. From 70% of data, you create your model, this model can be statistical model, okay? And after you have the model, you need to test the model. You need to validate the model to make sure it's working well or not. So you have some data here to test the model, okay? And see the accuracy. If the accuracy is above 90%, so the model is working very well, okay? So we, we can use this model uh, and test it in the practical example. If not, so we need to, to do more training by using more data sets, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, when we talk about algorithm of supervising machine learning, uh, it's not just like one, okay? There are lots of algorithm in machine learning. So we have linear regression, we have logistic regression, we have decision tree, we have random forest, we have a naive base classifier, um, so um, we use different algorithm depends on the applications, okay? So for example, <clears throat> so for example, for linear regression, okay? Uh, linear regression is used to estimate uh, the real value um, for the cost of housing, uh, the number of cars, um, the total sales based on the like continuous variables, okay? This is for linear regression. If you talk about, for example, uh, logistic regression, okay, it is used to estimate discrete values, which is uh, like uh, binary values, like zero and one, yes or no, true or false, okay, based on the given set of independent um, way. So, so for, for example, if you're talking about something like uh, the chance of winning, of winning, okay, it can be true or false, uh, or will it rain today or not? Okay, so it depends. Um, also, we have decision tree. So we use decision tree um, if we need to make a decision. Okay. Um, um, also for random forest. For random forest, it's the same like decision tree if we need to make a decision, but it is better because we are using different decision tree inside one algorithm. Okay, so um, we use if every algorithm depends on the application. Okay, and based on the data we have. So if we have a data like just zero and one or yes or no, so we just use uh, logistic regression. Okay, if we have a line linear relationship between the inputs and the output, we use linear regression. If we need to make a decision, so we have two options. We can use the decision tree or random forest. Okay. A uh, naive base classifier, we use this one if we need to make out to know the probability of something will be happened or not. So it depends on the application. So for example, let's take uh, more details about each, each type. So if we started with linear regression, so first of all, let's understand what exactly linear regression, okay? So linear regression analysis is a powerful technique and you operating the unknown value of a variable, which uh, is the dependent variable from the known value of another variable, okay, which is independent variable. So a dependent variable is the variable to be predicted or explained in a regression model 
um, we an independent variables is um, a variable or a variable related to the dependent variable in a regression um, equation. OK, um, so if you have a look here, for example, for very simple linear regression, so it is basically uh, equivalent to a simple line. Uh, which is with a slope, which is y equal a plus bx, okay? Where y is the dependent variable, um, a is the y-intercept. Uh, uh, we have b, which is the slope of the line, and the x, which is the independent variable. So intercept uh, is the value of the dependent variable y when the value, when the value of the independent variable x is zero, okay? Um, it is the, like the line cut the y axis, uh, where the slope is the change in the dependent variable from a unit increase in the dependent variable. Okay, so it is like a, a tangent of the angle made by the line with the x axis. Okay, now when we talk about the relation between the variables, we have a particular term which is known as a correlation. So correlation is a uh, very important uh, factor to check the dependent uh, or the dependencies between um, uh, different uh, variables. OK, what it does is it give us like insight of the relationship between different variables. So correlation is a very important term here. OK, guys. Um, now, if we talk about. Um, um, Mike, um, uh, now if you talk about regression line, okay, so a regression line is, uh, as I mentioned before, is very powerful technique used for predicting the unknown variable, or variable which is dependent uh, variable from the regression line, which is simply like a single line that best fits the data in terms of having the smallest overall distance from the line to the points. So as you can see uh, here in, in the plot, uh, the different points or the data points, uh, so between them and between the line, okay? These are known as a fitted point. Uh, then again, we have the regression line, which is the smallest overall distance from the line to the point. Um, so if we have a look at the distance between the point and the regression line, so what is this line shows? It shows a deviation from the regression line. Uh, so how exactly, how far the point is from the regression line, okay? One, one um, very important point here is a model fitting. So fitting a model means that you are making your algorithm learn the relationship between the predictors and the outcomes. So as you can uh, predict the future values of the outcomes, so the best fitted model has a specific set of parameters um, which best defines the problem at hand. OK, so for example, here uh, now if you have a look uh, like, like different types of fitting uh, which are available. So first of all, um, machine learning algorithm um, first attempted to solve the problem of under fitting. Um, that is of, of, a, like of taking a line that doesn't approximate the data well and make it, making approximate to the data better. So machine uh, does not know where to slope in order to solve the problem, and it can go ahead from uh, appropriate to overfit more. Okay. Sometimes when we say a model overfits, we mean that it may have a low error rate for training data, but it may not generalize a well uh, the overall population of the data we are uh, interested in. So we have underfitted and overfitted, and we have uh, got fit. OK, so this is all about like linear regression, uh, which is a type of uh, supervised learning. OK. Um, next, we have uh, to understand the need for logistic regression. Okay, uh, so let's consider a use case here as in election uh, are being held in our country. And suppose that uh, we um, are interested to know which candidate will win. Okay, now the outcome variables result in in binary, right? Either win or lose, right? 
Um, now here, the best fed line in the regression line is going below zero, since the value of y will be discrete, and that's between like zero and one. Um, the linear line has to be clipped at zero and one, right? Now linear regression gives us only a single line to classify the output with a linear regression. Um, our resulting curve cannot be formulated into a single formula as you option three different straight lines, right? What we need is a new way to solve this problem. So for that reason, people come up with a logistic regression. So let's understand um, what is logistic regression. So a uh, logistic regression is like a statistical model or a statistical method for analyzing the data sets in which they are one or more independent variables. Um, that's determine an outcome, and the outcome is uh, a binary class type. So, for example, a patient uh, makes like um, a checkup in the hospital, and he's interested to know whether he has a cancer or not. Um, so now, a patient data such as sugar level, bl like blood pressure, and the previous medical history are recorded, and a doctor check the patient data, and the outcome will be binary. Zero, right, if he has a cancer, and one if he doesn't have a cancer, something like this, okay? Um, so now let's have a look at the logistic regression curve, which is called, uh, which also called like a sigmoid curve, or the S curve, okay? So logistic regression, or sigmoid curve, or S curve, okay? So all are the same. The sigmoid function converts like any value from minus infinity to infinity to a discrete value, zero or one. Okay, now how to decide whether the value is zero or one from this curve? So let's take an example. Uh, what we do is uh, like provide um, a threshold, okay, value. For example, with the three, like threshold value of like 0.7 or, or uh, 4, um, this value. So any value above point um, seven will be rounded off to one, and anything below 0.7 will reduce it to zero. So you decide you can decide that's based on the application. Okay, so I can I can say now it should be 0.7 or it should be 0.5. It depends on the application. Okay. <clears throat> also, we have another type of regression. It's called uh, Boylan uh, uh, regression. So uh, we use to when we have non-linear data, which cannot be predicted with a linear model. So as you can see here, we have the equation y equals 3x cubed plus 4x squared minus 5x plus 2. Now here we, can, we cannot perform uh, this linearity, right? So we need uh, bilinear regression to solve this kind of problems. OK, guys? Any questions so far? Anybody has any questions so far? Okay, good. So we use linear regression if we have a linear relationship. We use um, logistic if we have the output just uh, binary, like zero or one. And we use bilinear if we have non-linear data. So as I as I mentioned before, it depends on the application. Uh, OK. Um, decision three. Decision three is one of the most used algorithm in supervisor learning. So decision three is a tree, like a structure in which uh, internal loot represents tests uh, on an attribute. Now, each attribute represents the outcome of a test, and each leave node uh, represents the class label which is a decision taken after computing all the attributes, okay? A part of from root to the leaf represent the classification rules, and decision tree is made from our data by analyzing uh, the variable from a decision tree, okay? So we use decision tree if we need to make a decision, okay? This is the best algorithm. So let's uh, take an example. Let's like implement um, the decision tree. So suppose here, for example, we have a data set in which we have the out, outlook. So I'll just ask Arina how, how the weather is today. Is it like sunny or it is 
rainy or it is windy. So this is an example, for example. So if we need to make a decision for tomorrow, tomorrow it will be sunny or not. We can implement these types of algorithm, okay? So what we can do is we can divide the data, okay, as a sunny, uh, overcast and rainy, okay? As you can see in the overcast, uh, we have humidity, high normal week. Um, so yes, during overcast weekend, play, right? So this depends on the data. Uh, and if you have a look at the rainy area, we have three yes and two no. What we are going to do is uh, split it further. And when we talk about the sunny, we have humidity, and in humidity we have high normal. So when the humidity is normal, we are going to play, which is a pure subset. And if the humidity is high, we are not going to play, which is also a pure subset. So it depends on the data which we have. We can make a decision if we can play tomorrow or we cannot play. If we don't have enough data, we need to split more to make a more uh, decision. OK. Another example. Um, for example, uh, I have an offer. OK, to go to like any company to work in a company and I make a, I need to make a decision if I will accept this offer or not. OK, for example, the salary is 50,000. OK, if it no, for sure, I will decline the offer because the salary is very low for me. OK, if yes, I will ask myself another question. So I need to travel there more than one hour. For example, I'm living in Hamilton if I want the, for Windsor. So I have to uh, drive for at least three hours or four hours. If it's yes, so I have to decline the offer. Uh, if it's no, so I will ask myself another question. OK, so it will offer me a free coffee. OK, if yes, I will accept the offer. If no, I will decline the offer. Something like this. So we are doing decision tree every day in our life. We make it uh, in our personal life and our work. So we always use a decision tree to make a decision. OK, or a good decision. Uh, OK. Now let's understand exactly what is random uh, forest. Um, so random forest is uh, a simple classifier uh, made using many decision tree models. So we have one decision tree, second, third and fourth. So we have four decision tree. For example, we can, it can make it can be five or six or seven. OK, it combines the results from different models and the results from many models is usually better than the result of one of either individual model. Right, because every a tree uh, votes for one class. The final decision is based on the majority of votes and this is better than a decision tree. Uh, because compared to a decision tree, it can be much more accurate. It can handle thousands of inputs, variables, without variable uh, deletion. And um, and what it does is it gives an estimate of what variables are important in the classification. OK. So um, to make a decision, you have two options. If you have not much data, you can use decision, decision tree. If you have lots of data, we are talking about thousands, OK, or 10,000 data, so you can use the random force because it's better. It, get, it can give you a better accuracy, OK? OK, uh, the second one is uh, naive base, OK? Um, so naive base is a simple but a powerful uh, algorithm for predicting modeling, OK? So if you need to make a prediction, OK? Um, now it is a classification technique based on uh, the base theorem um, with an assumption of independence among uh, predictors. OK, it divided into two parts, which are the naive and the um, and the base. OK, so in simple term and um, a base classifier assumes that uh, the presence of a particular feature in a class is unrelated to the presence of any other feature, even of this feature depend on each other or on uh, the existence of other features. OK, all of this um, characterization independently contribute to the probability um, 
that for example uh, a fruit is it is an apple or it is an orange okay and that's why it is known as a naive base model it is very easy to build and useful for very large data sets okay um, um so how we can do it okay if we take this example let's return it back for this one it's very easy you just implement this uh, equations so what is the equation means so for example we need to um, say the probability of uh, a being true when um, the given b is true okay it's equal uh, probability of b being true okay given a is true multiply by probability of a okay divided by probability of b okay Okay, let's understand more and take example. Okay, um, this example for what we have here, we have outlook, rainy, rainy, overcut, sunny, 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 and so on. And we will play or not. For example, here we'll not play. No, yes, 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 no, yes, no, yes. Okay, what we can do, we can do frequency table for sunny and rainy and overcast and just count how many we said yes and how many we say no. For example, for sunny, yes. For sunny, yes, one, two, this is no, no, three, right? So we have three. For sunny, no, how many we have? We have uh, one here and one here, so it's two, okay? The same for rainy, For the same for overcast, okay? After we have the frequency table, we make another table is called like code table. Okay, for outlook, yes and no, sunny, rainy, overcast. Okay, it's the same three, two, two, three, and four, zero. And then here we divide the numbers, for example, yes and no, the numbers that counting is five, right? Three plus two equal five. Okay, all of them are 14. If you count these numbers, it will be 14. Okay, for sun, for for rain, you know, it is the same. Two plus three equal five divided by fourteen. Okay, we'll do it here in the column. Okay, three plus two plus four equal nine divided by fourteen. This is a probability. Two plus three plus zero equal five divided by fourteen. Okay, so here three means it is the probability of sunny when yes is true right and this one means this is probability of sunny okay this one means the probability of yes right now if we use the same equation here this equation and just see we apply it here right so probability of yes is true when the sunny is true equal probability of sunny when it yes the, uh, multiply by probability of yes divided by probability of sunny so probability of sunny here this one right 0.36 probability of yes when, uh, when uh, probability of sunny when we say yes is true it should be 0.33 uh, multiply by probability of yes which it should be here is 0.64 we just implement the equation and we got the probability of yes how when it will be sunny is true Okay, and this one. We can do the same for probability of no when it is sunny is true. Okay. Any questions so far? So to do or to apply naive base is very easy. You just um, you just implement the equation and you don't. Any questions so far, guys? Thumbs up, please, to make sure you are hearing me. You have a question, Mandisa? Of oh, no question. Uh, okay. No, yes, I don't okay. have a question. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm just asking you every time because I I, I just need to see no you are you are here, okay? Sorry no, for it's asking. Okay. It's okay. okay. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Um. Another type in unsupervised learning. So we we now understand the first type of machine learning, which is supervised. Okay. Now we are talking about the second type, which is unsupervised learning. Um. 
Okay. So um, sometimes um, the given data is unstructured and unlabeled. Okay, so it becomes very, very difficult to classify the data in into different categories. So um, unsupervised learning helps to solve this problem. Um, this learning is used to cluster the input data in classes uh, on the basis of their statistical properties. So, for example, we can um, we can cluster different bikes, okay, based on the speed limit, uh, their acceleration, or the average they uh, are giving. Um, so, if you have um, a look to the workflow or as a process of flow of unsupervised learning. So the training data is a collection of information without any label. OK, so we have here like some apples with some bananas with some mango. OK, uh, we have the machine learning algorithm and then uh, we begin a clustering models. So what it does that it it distributes the data into different clusters. And again, if you provide any unlabeled new data, it will make a prediction and find out which cluster that particular data or the data sets belongs to or the particular data points belongs to. So one of the most important algorithm in unsupervised learning is clustering. OK. So let's say you understand exactly what I mean by clustering or clusters. Um, so a clustering is a process of dividing the data set into groups. Um, consisted of similar data points. Um, it means grouping of objects based on the information found in the data, uh, describing the object or the relationship. So um, clustering models uh, focus on identify group of similar records and labeling records according to um, the group to which they belong. OK, so and now it is done without the benefit of a better knowledge about the group and their characteristics. Uh, so in fact, we may not even know exactly how many groups are there to look for. Um, now these models are often referred to as unsupervised uh, learning models since uh, there is no external standard uh, by which to judge the model's classification performance. Uh, there is like no right or wrong answer to these models. OK. And like if we talk about why clustering is used, so the goal of clustering is to determine um, um, the, the different groups in a set of unlabeled data. Um, so the main goal of clustering is to make sense and the exact value from the last set of structured and unstructured data. So that's why clustering is used in industry because we don't know exactly what data we have and we need to use clustering to divide them in different categories and based on these categories we can design our algorithm or design our model to predict uh, a specific output okay and here if like you have a look at the different use cases of clustering in industry so first of all, it's being used in marketing. Uh, so discovering like different groups in group, like in customer database, such as a customer who make a lot of uh, long distance calls or customer who uh, use um, uh, IoT, okay, or using internet. Uh, they're also using uh, insurance, used a lot in insurance companies that are used in the recommendation of movies, right? It also used for Amazon. Uh, for recommendations of products. So there are many and many applications of uh, clustering. Um, so if we talk about clustering, there are three types okay, of clustering. Okay, First of all, we have the exclusive um, clustering, which is the hard clustering. So here an item belong exclusively to one cluster, not several cluster, and the data points belong to one cluster only. So an example of this is the key mean clustering. So key mean clustering does this exclusive kind of clustering. So I will talk about key means um, uh, after two, two slides from this. Okay. Secondly, we have overlapping. 
Um, so overlapping clustering, it is known as a soft clustering. Um, in so soft clustering, um, it is an item can belong to multiple clusters as a degree of association with each cluster. It is known and for example, we have a fuzzy or the semi-easy clustering, okay, which is being used for overlapping clustering, okay. And finally, we have hierarchical um, clustering. Um, so, um, Hierarchical clustering um, is a method of cluster analysis that we seek to build um, a hierarchical of cluster. Okay, the endpoint is a set of clusters, which um, like where each cluster is um, special from each other cluster, and the objects within each cluster are similar to each other. Okay, for example, here we make it divided like for example A and B, and for A we divide it again like C and D and E and F, and then, for example, for, for C, we divide it again, okay, for, um, like, for example, H and O, and so on, okay? Um, so one more time, for any clustering, we have three types. Exclusive, from the name, exclusive means it, it belongs to one cluster, okay? Overlapping from the meaning overlapping means it can be uh, included to one or two clusters. Okay, hierarchical. It means the cluster it can be divided into different types. Okay, and for each one we can divide it again and so on. Something like hierarchy. Okay. Um. So now let's understand exactly what I mean. Key means as I mentioned before. Key means is type of exclusive clustering and it is very very common so we need to understand this very well um, so key means clustering is an investigation whose main goal is to group similar elements of data points into a cluster okay and it's a process by which objects are classified into a predefined number of groups so that they are as much it is similar as possible from one group to another group but as much as similar within each group okay um now if we have a look at the algorithm working here so first of all let's start with identify the number of clusters like five or six or seven okay which a key is very important key here then again we find uh, that's like the centroid. We find the distance um, object to the centroid. Then we find the grouping based on the minimum distance. Okay. Um, now, if we talk about or you ask, um, you, like you ask yourself, has the centroid convergent? Okay. So if true, then we make a cluster. If false, Okay, so we then we repeat uh, the process again. So we need to find the centroid and we repeat all the step and again and again. Um, and this stops once we know um, the, the cluster, how many cluster we have. Okay. Um, again, to understand what I mean by key means, let's take an example. Okay. Um, uh, so let me here show you how exactly clustering um, was with an example here. So first of all, we need to decide the number of cluster, okay, to be met. Now um, another important task here is how to decide the important number of cluster or how to decide the number of clusters. Well, we'll get into that later. I will show you how we can uh, decide the number of cluster. But first of all, let's assume that the number of cluster we have decided here is three. It's just assuming, okay? I will show you later how we can know exactly what the number of cluster, okay? After that, we provide the centroid for all the cluster which is guessing, okay? Um, then the algorithm calculate um, 
the EU sliding. Okay. Um, distance of the point from each centroid and assign the data point to the closest cluster. How we can do this? It's very easy. We can do this by using the equation. For example, if you need to know uh, the distance between B and Q, so it's something like a triangle and you can calculate it. It's very easy. Okay. Um, after you calculate this, what you need, what is will be the next step? Next, when the, cent the centroid are like calculated again, we have our cluster for each data point. Okay, so we like, for example, here we have blue, right? We have green and we have red. After we calculate the centroid, now we know the centroid for this one and for this one and for this one. Okay. Um, then again, the distance from the point to the new cluster are calculated, and then again, the points are assigned to the closest clusters. So we repeat this again and again to make sure it is the closest one. Okay. And then again, we have the new centroid for the cluster. So for example, the, the previous one was here, now it is here. As the previous one was here, now it is here. The previous one was here, now it is here. Okay. Um, and again, we have, as I mentioned, the new central for all the cluster. And now these steps are repeated. We repeat these steps more and more and more and more and more. Okay. Um, and we have a repetition for the centroid. Okay. And we have the new centroid. And now these centroids are very close to the previous one. And that's now we are sure now we have the right centroid for each uh, clustering. Now, this is how key means clustering work. Uh, like basically it's very easy you just like you have to do we have just follow um this graph you have to sign number of cluster here we are just estimate like three i will show you how to do it now now you measure the centroid how we can do this by using the equations okay now you know the distance object to the centroid because you know you, you know the centroid it's very easy to know that this distance between each object and the centroid and based on the dis distance, you can grouping based on the best minimum distance. So we have green, we have red, and we have blue. If you have it with the centroid, and we repeat it many times, and it gives me the same place or very close place, okay, we are good. If not, we have to repeat it again and again till the centroid is very close to each other or similar, okay? So now we just have some objects like this, and in the end we have some synchronizes. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now the question I, I asked you at, at the beginning: How we can know or how we can decide the value of key, okay, or the number of cluster? Um, so it doesn't make any sense if you don't know how many cluster you are going to make. So to decide the number of cluster, we have something called the ELPO method. So let's assume first of all, uh, compute the summation squared error, which is SSE. For some value of K, for example, let's take 2, 4, and 6 and 8. Now, the SSE, which is the summation squared error, is defined as the summation of squared distance between each number member of the cluster and its centroid, mathematically. Uh, so mathematically, it gives you the equation, which is provided here. And um, like, if you brought the key against the SSE, you will see um, like the error. See here the error. This is the, for X axis, we have the number of cluster. And this is for y axis, this is the error. So, as you can see here, the error is decreased as the key um, or as the number of cluster gets larger and larger. Now, this is because the number of cluster increase it should be smaller. So, the, 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 like the distortion is also smaller. Now, the idea of elbow method is to choose the key at which the SSE decreases. So for example, here we have a look at the figure um, and we can see that the best number of cluster as the elbow. Uh, so as you can see here for this graph, this particular example, we can go and say, for example, it should be four because after four, 
if we make it five or six or seven, it gives you the same uh, value of SSE. And if you make it three or two or one, the percentage of error will be very high. So the best value here, it should be at the elbow, which is four here. Okay. Um, this is a method which we actually use to choose uh, or to size the number of clusters. This is if you if you if you want to make it manually. But now we have lots of programs which you can decide which the best number of clusters. Um, so in like in MATLAB, you find uh, a toolbox. Um, it's called the clustering, and you can use this one to choose the number of clusters. Uh, I think in um, Excel as well, um, I think there is a toolbox called, um, yeah, it's called XL states. Okay, if you open this toolbox inside Excel, uh, one of the options is called the key means. You can decide the number of key means. Uh, I can show you how to do it now if, if you like. Uh, let me stop sharing and share my screen. Okay. Uh, you see my screen, guys? Yeah. Yes, yes. You can see yes, the Excel. Yeah. yeah, so in MATLAB, you can do it. Uh, it's, it's called uh, uh, toolbox inside MATLAB is called the clustering uh, in MATLAB. In Excel, you can do it here. So if you open here something called XL states, XL states, you can, this one is just like, if you search about insert and get ads on and search about something called XL state, so you can download it if you don't have it. Okay. Once you have L XL state, open XL state in machine learning here. Open this arrow, you find something called X nearest neighbors. Uh, you can use it to like know how many key for your application, and you can use all this algorithm for any application you want. If you don't like to do it manually, because you know you have thousands of data, not just like uh, 10 or or 100 data, okay? So it's easy now, you can do it now by using MATLAB or using Excel or even Python, you can do it. Okay, um, this for, um, this for a key, uh, key means, okay? Uh, the last method is, here is reinforcement uh, machine learning. So, um, sorry guys. Okay. So, uh, for reinforced machine learning is a type of machine learning where um, an agent is both in like environment and learn to behave in the environment by performing certain actions and observing the rewards which it gets from those actions. So um, reinforcement learning is all about like taking an appropriate action in order to maximize a reward in the particular situation in, um, in this type, okay? Uh, so in the reinforcement learning, there is no expected output. We don't know the output actually, okay? Um, the reinforcement agent uh, decide what action to take in order to perform a given task, okay? So in the absence of a training data set, it learned from its expertise, okay? It learned from like try and error. Um, so let's now understand what reinforcement learning with an analogy, okay? Um, so here, for example, so consider uh, a scenario here where like this baby, okay, uh, is learning how to walk, okay? Now this scenario can go into two ways, right? First, the baby like starts walking and get the candy, okay? Since the candy like is the end goal, uh, so the baby is very happy because he have a candy now, so it's like a positive uh, reward, right? Now coming to the second scenario here, the baby starts walking, but falls due to like there are some toys in between. And now the baby is get hurt, okay, and doesn't get the candy, all right? So it's negative. The baby is very sad because he didn't get the candy, right? 
Uh, so it's a negative reward. So um, it's something like us as a human, we learn from our mistakes, right? Um, like by try and error. So reinforcement learning is also similar. Uh, and we have here an agent, um, which is a baby here, a reward, which is a candy, and so many it between between um, the baby and the candy, right? Which is the toys here. So the agent is supposed to find the best possible uh, like passes to reach the reward. So maybe this baby should go here first and then go like this first to reach the candy, or he should uh, take another way to go to the candy. Okay? How the baby knows this ways by try and error by expertise. So he will fell down today, he will fell down tomorrow, but after tomorrow now he knows how to reach the candy without any hurting, right? Uh, so, so guys here, if uh, you look at the sum of the important reinforcement learned definitions, first of all, we have here the agent. So the reinforcement learning algorithms, algorithms that's learned from try and error. Um, now, if we talk about environment, um, this is the agent, this is the environment where the agent move or the, like in this example, we have the toys, which the agent has to overcome in the environment, right? Uh, we have actions, um, which are all the possible steps that the agent can take. Um, then we have the reward, the candy, right? Um, we have also the policy, um, which is the approach that the agent used to remind uh, the next action based on the current states. For example, um, the baby learns now he should like not, he should like overcome these toys to go to the reward, which is the, the candy. So he will learn by, by expertise or learn by trial and error. Okay. Um, now let's talk about Mar uh, Markov decision process. Uh, basically, we can say Markov decision process is basically a mathematical approach. I can say it is assembly a process, which um, is a discrete times. We can say time control process is provide a mathematical like framework for modeling. Um, like for modeling decision, it provides a mathematical model for the decision making process. So basically, it's a discrete uh, time control process, which is useful for providing a framework for creating the models um, in situation where outcomes are uh, partially random and partially under the control of any decision maker. Um, there are the, like the following parameters used to attain a solution. Uh, that we have a set of action, a set of states, uh, rewards, uh, policies, and value. Okay, uh, there are all the factors that we take into account when we are working on a Markov decision uh, process. So um, let's take an example. Okay, for choosing here like the shortest boss uh, with a better uh, rewards. Now consider this given example here. So what we have is that. The given presentation and our goal is to find the shortest path between A and D, okay, with the highest reward. Each edge of um, of this presentation has a linked number, right? And this denotes the cost of traverse that edge. Okay. Now the task is to traverse from point A to point D with um, like the maximum reward. So uh, in this problem, the set of states are denoted by the nodes A, B, C, D, and the action is traversed from one node to another are given by arrow, uh, like A, arrow B, B, arrow C, or D, and so on. And the reward, okay, is cost represented by H, H, and the policy, if the boss taken to reach each destination. Okay, so you start off at node A, for example, here and take baby steps, right? Sorry, and take baby steps 
to your destination. Now you are at node C and want to traverse to node D. OK, so what is the best bus? You go to from C to D or is it best to C, B, D? OK, um, so you must again choose uh, the best bus, which in this case, for example, C to D. OK, so um, and for that reason, we take that bus to conclude that the best policy here is A to C and C to D because C, A to C and C to D give me the maximum reward, which is 15 plus 50, which is 65, which is the maximum reward. OK, um, this is the idea of uh, Markov decision process. OK, you have agent, you have reward, you have environment, you have policy and you have select which policy gives you the best or the maximum reward. OK, one more time. Now in Bison, you can uh, use or design a Markov decision. It's very easy. Uh, you have just write the coding and you can do it. Uh, but it is the main goal of this uh, presentation to give you understanding what the different types of machine learning, what I mean by Markov decision, what I mean by naive bus, what I mean by decision tree, what is the best algorithm for best application. So each algorithm is suitable for a specific application. So you have to know if I have this specific application, what is the best algorithm for this application? OK. And after that, it's very easy to implement the algorithm. You can do it mathematically or you can do it by using any software uh, like Python or um, MATLAB. OK. Uh, now uh, let's like move forward because now it's time is oh. We just have uh, half an hour, so I will try to uh, be very fast. Uh, now, next, move forward to the next part of our presentation, which is understanding about artificial intelligence, deep learning, and machine learning. Uh, so, data science that has been there for ages, and data science is the extraction of knowledge from data by using scientific techniques and algorithms. Um, people usually have a uh, certain level of dilemma or I would say um, like a certain level of confusion what it comes to differentiation between uh, the term is artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning and deep learning. So here I will try uh, to clear out these doubts. So artificial intelligence is a technique which enables machine to mimic human behavior. Um, now, the idea behind artificial intelligence is very simple, which is to make intelligent machines that they can take decisions on their own. OK. Um, now, for years, it was thought that um, computers would never match the power of the human brain. Um, well, back then, we didn't have enough data and computational power. But now, with big data coming into existence and like uh, with artificial intelligence is very possible, right? Um, now machine learning um, is a subset of artificial intelligence technique, which use uh, like a statistical method to enable machines to improve with experience. However, uh, in deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which make the consumption of multiple uh, layer neural network visible. It uses the neural network to simulate human-like decision making. So as you can see, if we talk about like the data science ecosystem, we have artificial intelligence, we have machine learning, we have a deep learning. Okay. Um, so as you can see here, like deep learning being the innermost circle uh, is very much required for machine learning. Um, as well as artificial intelligence. But now, why would deep learning require? So for that, let's understand um, the need for deep learning. OK. Um, so a step uh, like toward artificial intelligence was machine learning, and the machine learning was a subset of, um, of artificial intelligence. So um, machine learning, it deals with the extraction of pattern from the last data, data sets. 
but the data sets was not a problem. What was a problem was machine learning algorithm couldn't handle like the right dimension data where we have a large number of inputs and outputs, which rounds like thousands of dimensions, right? Um, so handling and processing such like such type of data becomes a very, very complex. Uh, this is another the, this is one of the limitation. Another challenge faced by machine learning was to like specify the feature to be extracted. So as we saw earlier in uh, all, all algorithm which are discussed, um, so um, now we have to specify the feature to be extracted. Um, as in achieving better uh, actors, is therefore without feature extraction. And so the challenge for the programmer increases as effectiveness of the algorithm very much depends on how insightful the programmer is. So as I mentioned before, we have lots of lost types of machine learning algorithm. We have supervised, we have unsupervised, we have reinforcement. And for supervised, we have linear regression, we have uh, naive bad, we have decision tree, we have lots of lost uh, types of machine learning. And we, ha we have to make a decision which one is is more suitable for this application. And once we know the, the algorithm, we need to train the model. So we have enough data or not. And we train the model and the model is not working well. So we have to train it one more again to make sure the accuracy is high. So it's lots of lots of uh, challenges when you're using machine learning. Um, so that's why uh, deep learning comes into picture, right? Um, so uh, deep learning is capable, capable of handling the high dimensional data. It also efficient in focusing on the right feature on its own, right? So if you use the deep learning, you don't have now to choose which algorithm you have to use, okay? So if you use artificial neural network, now you don't have to make a decision to choose which, um, which, um, which machine learning type is most suitable for this application. OK, um, so to understand exactly what is deep learning, let's see this video just one like one minute and then we we will discuss later. OK. So um, as we as we saw now, deep learning is a subset of machine learning uh, where similar machine learning algorithms are used, right, uh, to train deep neural network to achieve better and better accuracy. Uh, basically, um, as you as you saw, uh, deep learning mimic, right, the way our brain function and learn from experience. So as you know, our brain like is made of billion, right, of neurons. Um, that's 
um, allow us to do amazing things uh, when the brain of a small kid is capable of solving complex like complex problems which are very very difficult to solve even using uh, the supercomputers so how we achieve like the same functionality in programs and now this is where we understand artificial neurons and artificial neural network so um First of all, just to have a look at the different application of deep learning. Um, we have virtual assistants, uh, we have automatic machine translation, uh, we have object uh, classification, uh, we have like automatic game playing and much more. Um, now Google Lens is a set of vision based computing uh, capabilities that allows um, your smartphone to understand what it is going on, like in a video or in a photo. Um, for example, if you like point your phone at a flower, any flower, and Google Lens will let you know on the screen which type of flower is. It is Yasmin or what, what type of, of flower you have. Um, you can in that camera at any restaurant sign to see the reviews and other recommendations, right? Um, and another application is image uh, polarization or automatic colorization of black and white images. Um, as you know, earlier we didn't had like color photographs back there in like 1440s and 50s. Uh, we didn't have any color uh, photographs. So through deep learning, um, analyzing water shadows is present in the image. Uh, so how like the light is uh, bouncing off the skin tone of the people. Um, automatic colorization is now possible and it is all the possible uh, because of uh, uh, deep learning. So, uh, like, uh, like one, like one week uh, from like just like one month ago or one week ago. Um, I don't know if you see this one or not, but you see now in ancient uh, Egyptian people. Now, by using deep learning, we can know now how they all looks like. Okay, uh, they just use deep learning uh, application to just know how the ancient Egypt looked like. So it's something very amazing actually, uh, how deep learning now is using in, in different applications. Um, now also ChatGPT is the type of artificial intelligence. You can now ask ChatGPT any question and you can get answer in a few seconds. Uh, so it is very amazing uh, topic. Uh, now every, every application everywhere, you see uh, lots of application of deep learning um, and everywhere, which is amazing. So, um, so now deep learning um, uh, studies like the basic unit of a brain cells called a neuron. Okay, uh, so now let's understand the function of uh, a biological neuron and how we mimic this function in the perceptron or what we call in an artificial neuron. Okay. So as you can see here, an artificial neuron or a perceptron is a linear model, uh, which is based on the same principle, and it's used for um, binary classification. Um, it models a neuron which has a set of inputs, each of which is given a specific weight, and the neuron computes some function on this weighted inputs, and it gives the outputs uh, so it like receive an input corresponding to each picture um, and then sum up those inputs, applies a transformation and produces an output. OK, uh, it has generally like two functions, which are like the submission and transformation. Um, so uh, but the transformation is also known activation function. OK. Sometimes we call it activation function or sometimes we call it transformation. It's the same meaning, okay? So as you can see here, we have uh, the transfer function and then we have the activation function. Um, now the transfer function is the submission function um, of all the data we have, okay? This is how we mimic like our uh, biological neuron in terms of programming. So we have different inputs, and for each input we have some weight, okay? And then we have a submission and bias, and then we use activation function. I will show you what, what I mean by activation function now. 
and then we have the output. So from this input, we can predict the output. OK. Um, now the, the question which me, you may ask yourself, how the deep learning mimic um, the function of a brain? Well, uh, deep learning use the concept of artificial neurons that function in a similar manner as the biological neural uh, present in our, uh, in our brain. For that reason, we can say that deep learning is a sub-field of machine learning uh, concerned with algorithms inspired by the structure and the function of the brain for an artificial neural network. Now let's understand the functionality of uh, biological neuron and how we mimic this function in the perceptron or um, the artificial neuron. Now, if you focus on the structure of like biological neuron, it has um, uh, dendrites which is used to receive the inputs. Now, these inputs are collected in a cell body and using the exon, right? It is passed on the next uh, biological neuron, similarly like a perceptron receive multiple inputs, um, apply like different transformation and function, and provide an output. Now, as we know that our brain cell um, consists of multiple connected neurons called the neural network. We also have here a network of artificial neural called the receptors to perform a deep uh, neural network. Okay, the same. The same scenario, okay? Um, so uh, the activation function in neural network takes the input X, okay? Multiplied by the weight W, okay? BIOS um, allow us to shift the activation function by adding a constant, okay, to the input. For example, here, um, we added here some inputs, some BIOS, so now we have um, function W multiplied by X and um, summation by W1 divided by B, which is bytes. Okay. Um, so here activation function, what it, 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 it does, it translate the input into output, like yes or no. Okay. It maps the resulting value in between zero to one or uh, like minus one to one. Okay. So there are many and many functions that are used, uh, activation function here. So we have uh, linear, okay? We have unit or binary step. We have sigmoid or logistic. We have tans. We have uh, RELU. We have softmax. We have lots of lots of activation function. I will show you now which activation function is most suitable for each application, okay? Um, so if we talk about, for example, here, uh, if we talk about um, linear activation function, OK, so a linear transformation is the identity function where the dependent variable has a direct relationship with the independent variable. OK, um, now the question here, when to use linear transform function? Simple answer is when we want to solve a linear regression problem. So if you have a linear regression problem, use linear activation function okay so we apply um, a linear transformation function and next in our like list of activation function we have sigmoid or logistics the sigmoid function uh, looks like s shape uh, and when we use sigmoid it uses for a model where we have to predict the probability of an in an output okay this why we use sigmoids. So it depends on the application. Okay. Another type we have tan. Um, tan is also some very, very similar to a sigmoid, but better. Okay. So if, if you compare it, it is the red one is sigmoid and the green one is tan. Okay. So the, the range of tan function is from minus one to one. But for sigmoids, from zero to one. So the range of for 10 is better, is higher. Okay. Um, so the advantage here for 10, we have a negative input, right? Um, which can be mapped strongly negative, and the zero input will be mapped near zero in the 10 graph. So whatever you input you have, 
minus one or one, it can be mapped. But for sigmoid, we just focus on the range from zero to one. OK, so the time function is mainly used for classification between two classes. If you have two classes and you, make, you want to make classification, so tan or sigmoid can be used. OK, but the tan, the range is bigger from minus one to one. OK, um, the next one we have ray LU. Um, now real uh, LU only activate our node if the input is above a certain quantity. OK. While the input is below zero, the output is zero. So, for example, here the input is zero and the output is zero. Okay, but at a certain at a certain value, if you have a specific input, you have a specific output. Okay, so um, so we use uh, our ELU um, if we have a certain value x. If it crosses the certain three shows, it has a linear relationship with the dependent variable. And now this is very, very much different from a normal linear transformation. And the question may be asked when we have to use the LU transformation function. So we use it when we want to map the input value to a value in, an, in a range so that the input x to maximize uh, uh, like 0, comma x that is mapped. Uh, the negative input to zero and the positive inputs are output without any change we apply. Okay, so if you have a specific threshold you need to apply for your application, so this is the best uh, activation function you need to use. Okay, I know I am talking so much, but I will try to summarize. So, what activation function is most possible, most possible in your applications? So, um. So you can use binary step, okay? If you have, you are expecting output something like this. Uh, you can use um, soft plus. You can use uh, RLU. So you, it depends on the output you are expecting to have. You you can use the best activation function, okay? So this is the different equations. For sure, you can use it if you do it manually. But as you know now, we have lots of programs. Uh, which you can do uh, activation function and you can do deep learning. Um, uh, like we have a toolbox, it's called artificial neural network inside MATLAB. You can use it, or you can use this equation if you write to, to write the coding uh, inside uh, Python. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, deep neural network is. Um, it's really just um, a composition of 